So good afternoon and uh, welcome to CMC Markets, me Michael Hewson, hopefully Colin Szynski um, and this non-farm payrolls webinar. Unfortunately I think it's going to be slightly overshadowed by the um, decline in the pound overnight, the flash crash, whatever you want to call it. There's a number of factors at play here but first before I get started um, I have to display a risk warning. Um, just so that um, you know that anything that you hear here should not be construed as trading advice, um, invitation to trade or what have you. What we're going to try and do is I try and identify where the key chart points are vis-a-vis -vis not only the pound against the dollar but also against all the other major pairs, indices, precious metals, commodity prices, so on and so forth. And for the purposes of this video I will also be recording it so that if any one of you wants to listen to it back then you will be able to do so. So um, that's the risk warnings out of the way. Let's start and get let's go and get started. First and foremost let's talk about the pound because obviously it's, it's been it, the flash crash overnight has been pretty ugly and um, whatever the reasons for it um, whether it's algos, whether it's a narrative of political uncertainty. The tone was already set earlier in the week with respect to um, the, political un the, the political narrative coming out of the Conservative Party conference. But what hasn't helped it either is the narrative from the Bank of England. Now we've all seen the economic data out of the UK. It's not been bad. It's not been great either, but it's certainly not been bad, and it do certainly does indicate that the UK economy has bounced back. And if you if you ignored all the narrative around Brexit vote and everything else, and looked at the actual hard data that we've seen thus far, the PMIs in the past couple of months, the economy actually looks in fairly decent shape. So, f from that perspective, um, you know we are looking we're looking at a fairly we're looking at a fairly decent economic performance. And ultimately, anything else is just conjecture, as it is the IMF this week have rode back on their doom and gloom forecast of prior to the referendum and actually predict, um, for what it's worth or for what the IMF's predictions are worth, they predict ultimately that um, the, um, the UK economy will actually be one of the best performing G7 economies this year. They've helped. They have, however, revised their GDP forecast for 2017 down from 1.3% to 1.1. 1. 2, 1. So, obviously, that that is a concern going forward. But ultimately, um, the Bank of England's dovish narrative earlier this week, along with the political uncertainty that we've heard from also, Ang or the, the political narrative that we heard from Angela Merkel yesterday within a speech to German business leaders saying that the UK can't have a special deal if they don't agree to free movement of people and Francois Hollande at a dinner last night in Paris suggesting pretty much the same thing certainly not well maybe not in Paris but certainly on the European mainland coming can as it something to that, Michael? coming as it t can you add something yes you can Oh, I just wanted to add on that, that the uh, when we get these people say, making these kind of comments, it's important to know we're right at the very beginning of negotiations and, and they're still in the negotiating and, and public phase. And it's it's to be expected that um, that these guys are going to take a hard line because everybody does at this point in the negotiations. If they said, oh, gee, no problem, the, we, don't, we, we don't mind if Brexit, Britain goes and they can have whatever they want, then they have nothing to negotiate with. So I think going forward, we can expect to see a lot of volatility around these kind of comments but uh, at the same time I think also think they're irresponsible I also think that? they're totally irresponsible oh, of course they are because yeah. ultimately what you've got is yeah. you've got a president of France who won't be president of France when the negotiations get underway yeah. you've got a German Chancellor who's trying to play hardball at a time when the European economy is actually going great guns at the moment. They've got a banking system that's sitting on a bed of nitroglycerin, and mm -hmm. they're, they're basically talking about um, no special deal for the UK, which is fair enough. But ultimately, let's get some adults back in the room and actually have a, have a proper discussion. At the moment, the narrative is exactly the same as it was before the Brexit vote. Now, whatever your views about the Brexit vote uh, and why people voted the way they did, 
it's, syst it's systematic of a wider malaise, not only here in the UK, but in Europe and the US, a, a populist movement that is continuing to gain traction. And for European leaders to not even contemplate changing their negotiating position, the same negotiating position that they had in the lead up to the Brexit vote, is irresponsible. Essentially, they're ignoring. It, shows, they it shows you how out of touch they are. And actually, it could prompt the very financial crisis that central bank policy over the course of the past eight years has been designed to avoid. Now, I've been asked a question about, do I think that the pound has got further to go? Uh, at this point in time, yes, I think there is potential that we could well see a further decline in the pound. Given where we are at the beginning of this week, sorry, given where we are now at the end of this week with the payrolls coming up, I would not touch it with a very long barge pole. It's way too volatile. You know, if you want to trade the pound, do so at your own risk. It's very, very bad for the, what's going on at the moment. is It's great for volatility, but ultimately, if you get caught the wrong side, it can be very, very painful. And it's, you know, it's no coincidence that they call the the, the cable or the, the dollar sterling rate the widow maker. And one of one of the um, one of the delegates is just. Uh, said to me what's bad for the UK will be bad for Europe too that's absolutely spot on what for we've sure. got what we've got here at the moment is the political leaders basically staking out their political lines if you like but ultimately what they're doing is akin to dancing near the edge of a steep cliff and the big question is who's going to blink first the status quo is unsustainable it's unsustainable in France Francois Hollande said this morning that he wants to save the euro from an existential crisis. Wake up, President Hollande. It's already in one. And that gives you an indication as to how out of touch European leaders are. And at the moment, the pound is the punch bag. The pound is the punch bag for investor sentiment around this particular Brexit vote. But that could change. And I think that, for me, is the big thing. So let's let's start off with the pound against Can the dollar. Can I add one thing to that, Michael? Very quickly, because we need to move on, on to payrolls. Yeah, let's be clear on this also, though. And you're right, it's already happening, because even though euro's up against the pound, euro's breaking down against the U.S. dollar this morning. So people in other parts of the world are recognizing this is going to hit the, this is going to hit Europe, too, no question about it. So we, we saw the breakthrough, the um, previous lows, July lows, at 127.95 earlier this week. Now, obviously, this candle here is the the is this this is the flash crash uh, daily low. We have that around about 119 and a half. Depending on um, who you speak to, there's a different low. I, th I heard some instances of it actually trading as low as 114. Not too sure about that, I have to say. But ultimately, um, we've had a very volatile day and the biggest one day move in the pound pretty much since the Brexit vote when the pound dropped from around about 150 to close down at around about 132. So um, we're, we're certainly looking we're certainly looking at uncharted territory for cable at this point in time. It did find support just below 120. It could find support there again. But the, the next resistance level for cable is 125 initially. Um, that was my target for this week. Um, yeah, me too. And we've gone <laughs> straight. Out, we, yeah, we've gone straight below that. So I think it's going to find it very, very difficult to get back above it. Why do I say that? Mm -hmm. I say that quite simply for this reason here. This rally off the lows here stalled just below 125. So for me now, that remains the next any next any potential resistance level in the event of a rebound in the pound. But at the moment, trying to pick where it's going to go to next, and it's being a Friday. I think it's a very dangerous trade to put on. Now, let's talk about non-farm payrolls because ultimately markets are pricing in the probability of a December rate rise from the US Federal Reserve. I think we can pretty much rule out the possibility that we'll get a November rate rise. It's just not going to happen. Really isn't going to happen. So no, in, it's oh, seven days before the election. Yeah, seven days before the election, and no matter what the Fed does, one side or the other is going to try and spin whatever they do, and they're, they're going to get caught in the crossfire, and I think they're just going to sit on their hands because I, yeah. they're not going to know what to do anyway. Sit on their hands, put out a statement, and basically hide behind the t hide under the table which is yeah, pretty, pretty much, much which is pretty much what the bank of england are doing right now because ultimately with all this volatility what strikes me is how quiet the bank of england have been 
and I think that's I think that's that, that's a bit of a bit of a worry at the moment. The Bank of England have boxed themselves into a corner, and it's going to be very very difficult for them to actually intervene to try and arrest the slide even if they wanted to. Certainly an interest rate rise is not on the table but they may need to change their narrative ever so slightly in terms of their expectations for the UK economy because at the moment it's been overwhelmingly negative. Now you talked about euro dollar breaking down we've just seen the beginnings of that with this little breakout here. What are we expecting on non-farm payrolls? We're expecting we're expecting a number of in a region of around about 171,000. So anything I think between 150 and 200 is not going to alter the narrative that much with respect to the actual data. I don't know whether you agree or disagree on that, Colin. But I just think 150 to 200 isn't going to do anything. No, it's not, and I would I agree on one, that. Yeah. Um, I think the yeah. key data that I'm looking for is the average earnings or the average hourly earnings data. If that is in any way yeah. positive, that could actually drive um, expectations of a US rate rise even further. Now at the moment is a 65, there's a 65 there's a 63% possibility F Fed funds are pricing in a 63% probability I can show you it here of a Fed funds uh, a Fed rate rise in December. I would What's add November at now 25 tw 23.6 seems more I still think that's high. Yeah, it is high. But what I would say and this may feed into what's going on right at the moment in Europe. If there is instability in European financial markets as we head towards December, will the Fed raise rates irrespective of what the US economy is doing? I'm not convinced that they will. I think you're right. They already held off before Brexit. Yeah. So we don't know how all of this narrative is going to play out. For me, I think there's an awful lot of uncertainty out there. We've broken to the downside on Euro dollar. As long as we stay below 111.80, I think there's a good chance we could trade lower. I just got quickly asked about the Dow just then, um, so I'll try and squeeze that in. That's in a bit of a downtrend at the moment, but look at the way the price action is compressing here. It's compressing in a, in a tight range. I don't expect it to move that much either way, whatever comes out from the payrolls number. So we're compressing in a tighter and tighter range with respect to the Dow and I don't really expect it to do too much. It might find a bit of resistance at these peaks here around about 18,367 and it's got decent support through these lows here. So that, and, the S, and the S&P is fairly similar. Go on, at Colin. some point, though, we'll probably see the, the way it's compressing. At some point, we'll get an explosive move in one direction mm. or another. The question is just going to be, what's the trigger? I suspect unless we get a massive surprise, it probably won't be on farm payrolls. Maybe it's Sunday's debate between uh, Clinton and Trump or, or something else we don't know about yet. At some point, there's going to be a big move. It's just a question of what's going to trigger it. Indeed, indeed. There is one other thing I want to quickly show you before we um, before we go into the numbers. Look at this on the FTSE 100. Big top at 71.20. That's the previous highs. Also a decent support just below 7,000. So we're right, right in the middle of that at the moment. I don't expect us to break out of that today. Um, I think we'll probably stay within that. Post a very decent close. The FTSE is likely to probably go higher. Um, on any sort of neutral payrolls number on the back of the weaker pound. So here we go, getting ready to go. 20 seconds. Do you want to say something briefly about Canadian unemployment? Uh, I expect it to retrench a little bit from last month because there was a big run-up in the um, full-time, but uh, and of course in September we get the full-time, part-time shift over. Uh, I was calling for 15, the street's about 10. Here we go. Here comes the numbers. Okay, so we are... 5% unemployment rate for the U US, non-farms 156 on the low end of expectations. So that's probably going to be slightly dollar negative, only slightly. Um, average earnings comes in at 0.2%, so pretty much in line with expectations. And on a year-on-year -year basis, that's 2.6, which was pretty much as expected. The labour participation rate has ticked up to 65 no, that's the, that's the Canadian sorry uh, participation rate, so that's wrong. Um, the U.S. participation rate, oops. 62.9 versus 62.8 for... Like okay, so that's, so, that, so that's ticked up, and that would account for the tick up in the uh, unemployment rate. But the, uh, the Canadian yeah. numbers are very positive, very positive. So the, the non-farm payrolls, nothing number. Yeah, that's massive. Wow. That's a big jump for Canada. So that's a, that should prompt a nice little sell-off in the dollar CAD, I would imagine. Yes. 
Uh, yeah, because the uh, the thing with Canada was people were wondering if the economy was really turning around or not. July GDP turned out to be a little bit better than people were thinking, and and this is encouraging as well because the Bank of Canada has been counting on a big rebound in the second half, and it looks like they might actually be getting it. Mm. And especially because well we we did get the switch, so a full time drop back to 23 from 52. That's as expected. Big pop in part time from negative 26 to 44. Uh, also as expected when the uh, with the summer ending. Right. Let's also see if we can find out what the um, the whether there were any revisions. Yeah, there was a slight revision to the August Up number from 151 yeah. to 167. So you know, Which in terms, much accounts for the mess. Yeah, but 156 it versus 172. Yeah, so this yeah. thing's a wash. It's a wash. Absolutely. It's not really going to move anything. If anything, it's slightly dollar negative, as we can see from the dollar CAD chart. But you've obviously got the decent Canadian numbers on the back of that, and you've seen a little bit of a spike up. So pretty much. This non-farm payrolls number has been pretty much an anti-climax. We're not, pr we're not, we're not. I don't think we're going to see any significant market moves on the back of this number. It doesn't change the. Um, it, just, it, it certainly doesn't change the narrative with respect to a December rate rise. It's not strong enough to push the odds of a dollar, a dollar, a U.S. rate rise higher. But it's not weak enough to also. Um, trigger the calculus in the other direction. Let's have a quick look at gold prices because they've really washed out in the past few days and actually this chart is quite interesting because from what we've seen here is we're actually teetering on the brink of the 200 day moving average here. We've seen a little bit of a move higher in the gold price which you would sort of expect on a slightly weaker payrolls number um, and you can certainly see that on, on the basis of the five minute chart. I've just been asked a question about do you think the pound will recover properly once Brexit is complete? Um, now you're asking me to be a fortune teller and ultimately I think in the long term it's probably going to um, recover at some point but the big, uh, my biggest concern at the moment is that even if Theresa May triggers Article 50 in March there's a two-year process so this two-year process is like the negotiations are likely to ebb and flow. So I think it's going to be very, very difficult to even talk about where the pound will go in the short to medium term. I think as long as economic growth in the UK manages to stay above the flat line or doesn't go into contraction, then yes, I think it will. Because ultimately what it will do is it will limit the downside in terms of interest rates. As it is, the new Chancellor has already indicated that um, QE may well have run its course. Um, certainly that was the impression that I got from him when he was talking um, in in the States yesterday and that ultimately he was going to focus much more on uh, fiscal side of things. We'll know more about that in the autumn statement on November the 23rd. But sterling at these levels, I think it's I think it's extraordinarily oversold. I think it's a crowded trade. I certainly don't think euro sterling is anywhere near um, where it, need, it should be with respect to the euro above 90 going towards 93 I think that's way I think that's way too weak in terms of the pound against the euro because make no mistake Europe has massive problems yeah it's that's getting really overdone and um, and the, the longer the pound stays down the more competitive the UK gets relative to Europe and that's the point um, there's also the fact that I think inflation expectations while they're rising here in the UK at the moment um, the inflation still remains fairly benign but what what I would say is that um, it, it's, it's gonna it's gonna be it's gonna be very very difficult for me to justify euro sterling up anywhere near 94 95 because Mario Draghi for a start won't want it at those sorts of levels and what will the ECB do because they do not want a strong currency any more than anybody else. Yeah, so f for me, I think in the, on a long-term basis, euro sterling is overpriced. Um, cable's a slightly different ball game because of the direction of US monetary policy relative to the UK. Um, and that's really going to be a significant unknown for quite some time. But certainly on the basis of this chart here, euro sterling is way overbought. The big question is where do we where do we close? At the moment, I've had to rip up all my forward forecasts for um, the pound against the dollar. 
and to be quite honest it's now it's now a dart throwing contest because ultimately politics now is so much a factor when it comes to talking about markets that even if you get the overall direction right it's how you get there that's going to be problematic so um if we if we don't close above 0 0.9 at the end of this week then i would suggest that we could drift back lower on euro sterling and that sterling could bounce back um ultimately for me in Europe they still have a massive problem with their banking system they have a massive problem with Deutsche Bank and for all their threats if these politicians really do think that a hard Brexit is the way to go then I think we could have a new financial crisis on our hands over the course of the next few weeks and months Colin do you have anything that you want to cover that I haven't already done so uh, just, we, I think we just wanted to mention that uh, that we are seeing in the uh, the dollar CAD is uh, is dropping back a little bit on the uh, on the Canadian dollar news. So the loonie is picking up uh, on that. I, I totally agree with everything you said about the uh, the pound and and Europe. I think we're going to see quite a few uh, fairly sizable swings uh, in it. I, I do suspect that probably this this move we've had overnight has put in at least some kind of a bottom for the near term. I think this was a real shakeout and flushing of a lot of the the weak hands and the and the stops out there and a lot of the program orders that were in there have probably been flushed out like we've seen with with other uh, moves like this in the past in in the united states we've had a couple in in 2010 and 2011 and, and, and other times and uh, and so it'll be interesting to see now i think this uh these the, we'll probably see though we could end up in a situation like crude oil where we've got it trading between 120 and 125 but but big big swings within that range uh, uh day to day and intraday over the next while one other thing, the Bank of England and the potential for a November rate cut. I've heard an awful lot of people talking about the fact that uh, the Bank of England may cut rates again in November. Well, if they do, they're mad. But I think that's pretty much off the table. I now. think the it's pr doing their job for them. Yeah, it is. Um, I just don't see the rationale for doing that. And the markets are putting an eight and a half percent probability of that happening. So certainly, it doesn't look as if um, it certainly doesn't look as if that particular boat is going to float. No matter how much you may hear people say on TV, oh yeah, yeah, they're going to cut rates again. Why would they do that? I thought it was a mistake for them to cut rates in in the first place um, in in August um, because basically they've given themselves nowhere to go. The pound was always going to slip a little bit. They didn't need a rate cut to do that. The fact that the pound had dropped from 145 to 130 was the equivalent of a rate cut in exchange rate terms. So why do they need to compound it by cutting rates again? given how rates given how low rates already are so let's move on to Brent crude because also that is going to be a bit of a problem going forward when we come to look at the price of petrol or gasoline at the pumps here in the UK because ultimately Brent crude prices are at their highest level since June and sterling is at its lowest levels in 31 years so there is going to be a little bit of price inflation coming through uh, at the petrol pumps over the course of the next few weeks whether or not supermarkets try and absorb some of that in terms of trying to get you to shop at their particular brands um, given the excess competition there is between the big four and LD and Lidl we'll have to wait and see but ultimately there is inflation coming down the pipe um, the problem is it's not the it's not the best kind of inflation because it's going to get it's going to hit consumers in the pocket I'm being asked fifty five dollars I'm guessing in Brent next. I think what we need to do is we need to break through this top here at around about fifty two and a half dollars a barrel, but certainly it looks more feasible than it did say for example a few weeks ago and actually, for me, this particular level, this dotted line here from this move down here is really the big big level on 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 Brent crude it's around about fifty three dollars and fifteen. That's a 61.8 Fibonacci retracement level from the for, from the down move from the peaks that we saw in 2015 to the 2016 lows. So that for me, I think, is the big level on Brent, just above where we are now, and it's a similar sort of story on WTI. So I wouldn't yes. get I wouldn't get too bullish on crude oil quite yet. Russia came out this. Go on, Colin. 
Oh, sorry, I was just going to mention with uh, with WTI in particular, it, it's had this nice run up on, on OPEC and, and there's no question about it, U.S. inventories are coming down, which is really good in providing some fundamental support, but we're here at 50 and we stopped at 50 again, and, and the reason we stop at 50 every time is because there's a feeling out there, and it's likely true, that once you start getting above 50, the US, uh, some of the U.S. shale production that's been shut down starts to become profitable again, so there's a pretty solid cap in this low 50 to low 50s area so we've got it would really probably take something to really get it to move much higher than it already is we've got a good the the um, the falling uh, the falling inventories in the states provide a good floor but at the same time you've got the issue of that u.s supply could come back on if prices start getting much higher and rig counts have been increasing so that mm -hmm. tells you that tells you all by itself I mean, having said that, as we're heading into winter, demand will tend to pick up, and I think there's an, an expectation. An picks up. Yeah, so that that could well factor in. But at the moment, we're also we're also, um, you know, l looking looking at the prospect that at some point um, that demand supply shift will happen. But the Russian mm -hmm. oil minister t today said that Russia would not be part of the OPEC freeze. Um, when they when they meet next week in Istanbul. So, as I suspected, Russia doesn't want any part of the freeze in oil production. So, how effective, essentially, will it be? And that's, and that's what really interesting because there had been rumours that uh, that non-OPEC countries would start to get involved, and the only way that happens is if Russia does it. Exactly. The Americans aren't. Yeah. So, I mean, I said at the time when people were speculating on that, good luck with that. Yeah, and, exactly. Um, you know, it's it's pretty much playing out as I suspected it might. Russia has no has no reason to help out Saudi Arabia because ultimately it's Saudi Arabia now that are feeling the pinch. Iran still wants to boost its productive capacity up to four million barrels a day. It's not there yet. It's around about three point six, three point seven. So at the moment, it's all about um, a production cap or a production freeze, whatever you want to call it, they never stick to them anyway. So really, it doesn't matter to a hill of beans. And if the dollar continues to strengthen, that could also limit the upside in Brent crude. So I think we're at very, very key levels at this moment in time. And ultimately, I would be very cautious about being overly aggressively long of oil at these particular levels, because I think we could see a little bit of a pullback. Um, yes, absolutely. Among the shortest, uh, yeah, when we talk about things like the shortest amount of time, like how long does it take between the light, be, uh, the light going green and the, the horn behind you starting to sound, another one is how fast between the uh, OPEC people reaching a deal and how fast they start cheating. Well, exactly. That's absolutely right. And I think uh, the markets did front run a little bit yeah. of a deal. So. Yeah. So but, Yeah, which is another thing too. So, I mean, at that point, you're you're... you're your balance of probability starts to shift towards a disappointment and oil coming back down when you've got and on top of that you've got the US production lim uh, issue exactly okay so um bef and before i wrap this up ladies and gentlemen is there any other questions that you would like to push in our direction ladies and gentlemen before uh before i wrap this up and uh, record it I've been asked to recap what I feel about Euro Sterling. Yeah, I think Euro Sterling is way overdone. I think that at some point we're going to get near the top. Now, I know an awful lot of people are talking about Euro Sterling back at parity, but that basically then presupposes that everything's fine in Europe, and it isn't. So I think there's going to be an awful lot of what I would call toing and froing. And on a long term basis, I would expect Euro Sterling to go back to sort of around about 0 0.83, 0 0.84 um, before before it gets anywhere near 0.905. Um, Mr. Draghi will not want Euro Sterling anywhere near parity because ultimately the trade relationships that are currently in place between Europe and the UK are, um, are doing fairly well. And actually the high Euro is hurting European competitiveness when it comes to imported goods here in the UK. So Mr. Draghi won't want a strong Euro. So he will probably do as much as he can to try and talk it down. So um, from, my, from my perspective, I think Euro sterling at these sorts of levels is overpriced. But ultimately, I, I'm struggling to find out a decent place to sell it. I'm probably going to see, wait and see, um, and have a fresh look at it next week wait for it to settle down a bit because at the moment sentiment around sterling is 
it, it's not where I particularly want to be at the moment. And having been trading these markets and involved in these markets for the last 25, 30 years, sometimes the wisest course of action is to sit on your hands for a bit. Being asked about dolly yen, is there a trend change? Yeah, I think there potentially is. Um, what we've seen here is it break above our long-term trend resistance and currently we're holding above this support area which was resistance and has been resistance pretty much since early 2016. So this break up here is significant but what I've been looking for here is a breakthrough 104.30 that's the re that, that's the big key but also it is actually quite interesting that you can actually draw a line through the highs here so while I would say there's potentially been a trend change here I'm not totally convinced of it because we haven't broken the September peaks at 104.30 and then even if we do break 104.30 we could still run into trend line resistance all the way up here at 106 as well as the 200 day moving average so you could argue that we're starting to carve out a little bit of a base is this a potential double bottom here? You Almost know, a triple bottom. Well, it's not because where's your um, you know, the, yeah, fair uh, enough. That's you, fine. You've got this here, so yeah. I take your point totally. But you know, you've got this big peak here, and then you've got this these 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 twin peaks here. So is it a triple? Yeah. Is it double? There is solid support below 100. The big question is, can we get through 10 104.20? If we can, we could go for a little bit of a four or five bigger five big figure run. Yeah, can I add something to that? Sure. Um, so something we want to consider also here when we're looking at this is we're seeing the pound getting getting treated like there's a big financial crisis going on. We're seeing the euro starting to break down. and But when we look at the capital flows on the other side, we're not getting the capital flows into gold. We're not getting the capital flows into the yen. When when you're seeing the, the capital is coming out of the out of the, considering the UK, they're considering the UK as a risk market and, and treating and, and crushing the pound, but we're not seeing the capital going back into the defensive place, so we're getting a disconnect here. So far, all the money has been going into the US dollar, but either what you're going to end up with is either you're going to end up with more capital going into the yen and gold, and pe if, if it actually people are, do start getting worried about uh, particularly political risk, whether in uh, in Europe or the United States, uh, on the, either you're going to get more of that or people are going to figure that, okay, well, this is blowing over and then the pound starts coming back up but you do you are getting a pretty serious disconnect here I think between these markets can't argue with that so we'll get a reversal somewhere it's just a matter of where does it happen mm. and when and, and so the big one to watch for on, on US political risk of course is that the, uh, the round two between Trump and Clinton is on Sunday night mm. so uh, so keep an eye out on that that's uh, 9 p.m. Eastern time so that's 2 a.m. Monday in London yeah, so Sunday night could be interesting in Asia. Yeah, absolutely. So you have to bear that in mind as well, which again is one of the reasons why I'm a little bit reluctant to run anything over the weekend, this particular weekend, because so many different things can happen. And uh, it's just not worth the risk. Okay, so ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening to this Non-Farm Payrolls webinar on the 7th of October 2016 like to thank you for your input, your questions, and I'll probably see you all again, or speak to you all again, same time next month. Thanks very much for coming along, and thank you, Colin. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today.